this is an event display from the Atlas experiment, which is an experiment that I'm on and Louisiana Tech is involved with. It's located at the Large Hadron Collider, which is a proton, proton collider uh, located just outside of Geneva, Switzerland. And it's been taking data now for a couple of years. So this is a computer image of uh, one of the sort of events that, that I study, that I'm interested in, in these particle collisions. Uh, I want to, before I talk about, about that in detail, uh, flash up a little piece of history. This is a picture from circa 1982. I'm doing this because a member of the audience asked me to be sure in this TED talk to, to portray to the world that people from Louisiana are not all like swamp people or <laughs> Duck Dynasty or uh, Sons of Guns or all these reality shows that you see. So these are these are three budding young physicists circa 1982. The guy on the left here, Jim Kennison, is at John Hopkins applied physics lab now and the uh, young lady Lisa Baker is a material science in private industry. And the idiot in the middle here uh, with the beard, uh, at the time this picture was taken had never left the south, uh, had never been on an airplane, uh, needless to say had never been outside of the country, and had no idea whatsoever what was in store for him in the next few years uh, to come. Um, what I do is I collide things together, which is fun. We all like to blow stuff up. We collide very high energy particles together. We see what comes out. I'm particularly interested in something that's called the strong force, the, the, or quantum chromodynamics, the force that holds protons and neutrons together inside of atoms. It's also the force that holds the little bits that make up protons together. These things are called quarks and gluons, and they exist inside, for example, protons. And it's really the quarks that I study. The force that holds them together, the strong force, is weird. It's, it's unlike any other force we know in nature. Most forces uh, we know in nature, like gravity, it gets weaker as you get farther apart. The strong force gets stronger. It's like a spring, and as these particles pull apart in these high energy collisions, the energy gets stronger and stronger between them, higher and higher energy density between them, and it starts to fragment uh, apart because Einstein was right in E equals mc squared. And at some point, they create new mass, actual m matter out of the energy as they're pulling apart and they create these jets of particles and that's really what I study. So we have uh, protons colliding, bunches of protons in this 27 kilometer uh, ring called the Large Hadron Collider. The uh, quarks and gluons interact and they produce jets. And for some reason some people think this is complicated. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't get it. I, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try to explain all the particle physics to you because I can't because I have a stopwatch and I've got 15 minutes. And, and, and so what I'd like to do is remind you that this is what we're after, okay? But kind of talk about the bigger picture of particle physics. How does it fit into society? What role does it have? What has it given us? And to do that, I'm going to start with the technology. This is, this is our experiment. This is the Atlas detector. This is cool. This is such a cool, this is, this is a people, all right? That's the a, that's a size of human beings. This is about a 10-story structure, and it's twice as long as it is high. Um, about um, uh, 44 meters in length. I got my little cheat sheet here to remind myself of all, all these numbers because I'm getting old. Uh, about 100 million channels of electronics with this device. It's a 7,000 ton object. Uh, high uh, uh, magnetic fields produced by superconducting magnets uh, inside it. It's a remarkable device. This detector, the other detectors, and the Large Hadron Collider together form the largest scientific instrument we have ever built. This is mankind's greatest scientific technological achievement in terms of building a single device for the study of, of, of physics. Um, we, take a, we see about a billion collisions per second. We write about 200 to, uh, to disk per second. Uh, this is the collaboration. And this is a lot of what I really want to talk to you about today. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, 38 nations uh, represented on, on our experiment and the other there are other nations on, on the other experiments. You see they come from every continent, uh, 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 South, South America, North America, uh, Africa, uh, CMS has Egypt uh, uh, as a member of the institution, India is on the other experiment. We have Turks and Greeks working together. <laughs> we have Moroccans and Israelis working together. This is a remarkable achievement, and, 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 and I'm going to get back to this in a moment. I mean, we even have Americans and French working together. It's, it's just, it's, 
it's such an interesting environment to be in. It's, and that's part of what I want to talk about today. Can particle physics save the world? Can particle physics save the world? That's an, it's an interesting question to me. And I have three answers. And the first answer is no. Um, it's sort of the obvious answer. Because it's so esoteric. It's so esoteric. What a, this, this is the standard model Lagrangian. It is the mathematical expression of everything we know about particle physics. And I only show it to scare you. That's the only reason it's up there. <laughs> It's for you to say that and go, ah! Oh, yeah, so. And this is a whole separate talk. But it's so cool that that esoteric mathematics, which is written in, in the form of four-dimensional objects and, and tensor objects, corresponds to nature. The math works. The math is somehow real in a way that I honestly don't understand. But we know that we can measure. This is what I did uh, as, a, as a graduate student. I measured uh, these particles called Z particles. And it's, and it's correctly described by all that weird and wonderful map, which uh, is not so huge, is not so big that you can't fit it on a t-shirt. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very succinct way of describing nature, and, it, and it's so cool. But there's no obvious connection there, really, to our society. I mean, how, how testing something that looks like that, how does that going to save the world? I don't know. Let, let's explore a little bit farther. When I give talks like this, Mayor, when I, when I talk to, like, the civic organizations, things like that. I often talk about a story that occurs with uh, Michael Faraday. That's the fellow on the left here, Michael Faraday, one of the uh, pioneer physicists of the 19th century. And Gladstone, that's this fellow, uh, was invited uh, to uh, Faraday's lab, and he goes and, and uh, he sees uh, Dr. Faraday's equipment. Faraday's like any physicist. He's like, check it out. I got a magnet. I put it in the coil, and I get the current out, and it's really cool. And it's, you know, that's how we do things, right? And so, and Gladstone, as you can see, is not easily amused. He, he turns to <laughs> He turns to him and says, well, but Dr. Faraday, of what use is it? Greatest line uh, a, a scientist has ever come up with to answer that question. Faraday says, sir, I do not know, but I'm sure that one day you will tax it. <laughs> and it's true because what Faraday worked on in electromagnetic induction is the basis of electrical power generation. It's why your ATM cards swipe with the little magnetic strip. It's the basis of almost everything we have in our society, technology-wise. He was absolutely right, but he, he couldn't foresee what it was used for. Well, we already know one use of particle physics. One use of particle physics comes about in trying to understand our universe. Our universe is very weird, and we understand that weirdness much better now than we did even 20 years ago. We know that our universe is 13.7 billion years old. We know that number to 1%. That's not a guess. That's a very good measurement now. We know that the universe actually consists about 73% of something called dark energy. Somebody asked me what dark energy is. I have no idea. I have no idea what dark energy is. And, and about 23%, and these numbers are, are fairly well known now, is something called dark matter. If somebody asked me what dark matter is. Dark matter. I have no idea what dark matter is. But the cool thing is the, the substances that we now know have to exist may be discovered in these particle accelerators. Dark matter may be a new fundamental particle that we don't know about. If so, we might be able to see it in the Large Hadron Collider. It's one of the things that we're looking for. We're trying to understand the nature of dark energy. Does it come about because of dimensions beyond the four that we know about? This is something we can actually look for in these particle colliders. So understanding our universe, this basic research, is one of the things that, that particle physics will, will do for us. The universe is, is enormous. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, all inspiring at every scale. This is the Hubble deep field picture. I don't have anything to say about that. I just want to show it to you. That's the most beautiful picture I've ever seen. That's 10,000 galaxies. Uh, yeah, 10,000 galaxies, located in a region of space about one millimeter by one millimeter at arm's length. That is one of the most iconic photographs I've ever seen in my life. Um, so can particle physics say the world? Well, it tells us something about the universe we live in. It tells us something about the universe we live in. Another great quote I want to share with you comes from a fellow named uh, Robert Wilson. Robert Wilson was the first director of Fermi National Accelerator Lab, which is a particle collider uh, here at a, a collider lab here in the United States. And he served on the Manhattan Project. Great uh, Plains men grew up in, in, in North Dakota. And when they were in Congress and testifying before Congress, Dr. Wilson was asked, how will 
this accelerator help national security? And he comes up with this wonderful quote, it's worth reading. It only has to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? This is the TED technology entertainment design, or, 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 50 years ago. I mean, all the things we really venerate in our country, in our patriotic battle, it has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to make it worth defending. I love that quote. And you could extend that now to CERN, into the Large Hadron Collider. It's, it's about our world. It's, 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 it's about what makes us human, humane, and what makes humanity humane. Particle physics, which is where the World Wide Web was created. The World Wide Web was created in order for particle physicists to talk to each other, to communicate these ideas across great distances. Particle physics is a model for cooperation in our interconnected 21st century world. That, to me, is, is how particle physics can save the world. The knowledge is great. The spin-off technology is wonderful. These are all well worth the investment. But if more than anything else, particle physics gives us a cooperation model. I love this picture. Um, I, I show this often. This is the control room of my experiment, Atlas experiment, at the time of the very first collisions. This is um, a group of scientists. Uh, there's Americans here. There's French. There's Italians. This fellow over here in the, in the kind of ratty looking uh, coat here, that's Ron Dulaputi. Uh, Indian, uh, as you might guess by the name, but from Louisiana Tech University. He just defended his uh, uh, dissertation, will be getting his PhD this summer with me, my first uh, student on this experiment. People from all over the world collaborating for this higher goal of learning about what makes up our universe and how those pieces interact. So knowledge changes people. Knowledge changes people. The idiot you saw earlier in, the, in that picture of the guy with the beard from 1982, is not the same person who's talking to you now, right? The, the, the person who's talking to you now has lived in Geneva and lived in Chicago and done all these crazy things and met all these crazy people in particle physics. Knowledge changes people. And it changes us sometimes in a way that causes us to exceed our national boundaries, conceive, uh, exceed our, our preconceptions of the world. And it's a scary proposition. It is absolutely frightening. Uh, this is the famous Flammarion engraving. I, you've probably seen this before. As we peek out, and see the, the larger universe kind of beyond what we grew up with and we're used to. It can be a frightening experience, but it's well worth it. It's well worth it. It's an experience that I think is key in this uh, interconnected world we find ourselves in now. And with that, I thank you for having me today.